think the biggest one that you know I, I like to actually talk about uh, is just that it's it's not for kids. <laughs> you know, uh, very often you know, I'll go to the networking events and uh, you know tell people about you know the business and they'll say, oh, like that's really really cool. You know, I'll let you know if I hear of any parents looking for uh, you know just teacher for for their kid. Um, and I actually will play a little dumb and I'll, I'll, I'll actually tell them like, or I'll ask them, you know, I mean, what, what made you think it's not just about kids? They're like, Hmm, I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you know, we do do classes at Google city group, uh, other major corporations. Um, hmm. and we teach, you know, business and life values through the game. So, um, Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Expert. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups in the seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of uh, Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to uh, strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we have another great uh, guest on the podcast, Evan Rabin. And uh, Evan, we're going to be talking about a few different things. And uh, Evan has a, a chess background, and he'll, I'm sure, get into that a bit more. Um, but one of the things we'll talk about is uh, using chess strategies as they're related to business. Also talking maybe about uh, having a positive mindset to achieve goals, um, how to start a business when you're using classes and trainings as a focus of the business, um, being open to learning a bit, as well as uh, everyone is a beginner at some point and you have to start sometime. And uh, so it should be a great a great uh, episode and a great discussion and uh, excited to have Evan on and with that much. Welcome on the podcast, Evan. <clears throat> Thank you. And yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So now before we dive into the topic at hand, just as a reminder, the audience, you were on the, the sister podcast for the inventive journey. So definitely encourage everybody to go check out that episode with Evan and learn mo a bit more about his journey. But um, for those that haven't had a chance to, to go catch that episode yet, or maybe it's a bit of a teaser, so they will go catch that episode, uh, maybe introduce yourself, just uh, take a minute or two, inter introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, again, uh, great, great to be here. Thanks for you know having me. Um, yeah, I'm a national chess master, uh, an owner of Premier Chess. Uh, we uh, actually run uh, corporate classes, school programs, private lessons, uh, a lot more uh, all over the country in person and virtually uh, around the world. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I love teaching. Uh, business and life lessons uh, through the game. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's great to be on the show. Awesome. Well, that was definitely a, a great introduction and excited to have you on. It's always kind of fun. Uh, mo mo my or some total my experience with chess has been my son loves to play it so he will occasionally ask me to play it and I used to be able to beat him and now he or he usually beats me most of the time anymore and uh, that and watching movies and uh, tv shows about it so it's always kind of fun to actually know or meet or have someone on that's uh, or uh, done that a lot or played a lot more uh, or is uh, at a higher level than I ever will and so with that you know it kind of one of those things that it from my limited experience is, you know, chess is a game of strategy. In other words, you, you know, from my limited experience, you really can't just think one move in advance because if all you think is one move in advance and you're, you know, the person you're playing against can think two or three moves in advance, they've got you outmaneuvered. And so it does take that strategy of being able to anticipate or look ahead of where things are going. And that certainly has overtones of business along with how you strategize, how that's related to business, how you have to look into the future, look at what your competitors are doing in that. So kind of just as a, maybe a softball question, so to speak, but how does, you know, kind of what are the lessons or the takeaways what are the how does chess and the strategies you you use in chess uh relate to business um so there's quite a bit my friend and, and colleague jim egerton actually wrote a book uh business on the board uh which actually talks about uh pretty much what all verticals of business uh could learn uh through the game um but it's everything from you know in finance talking about risk management how you know you do need to take uh, risks to, uh, you know, to, to ultimately, uh, you know, get a return on investment. So, um, you know, some players, for instance, will be, you know, trying to hold on to, you know, every single piece 
right? And they'll mm. make moves to like over protect. Um, and I, you know, explain to them that, you know, you're not going to essentially ever win a chess game uh, just by, you know, protecting, mm. right? to uh you know certainly take uh you know a, a, a little bit of risk um you know especially you know the stronger you get right um you know i, I should tell you know students all the time that are starting out you know look uh, honestly at, at the beginner level yeah you could actually win a game just by essentially not blundering right not like losing pieces and following principles um, but then you're going to get to another level where you need to like actually outplay your mm. opponent. So, um, you know, one of the ways to you know do that is to, yeah, like, like take risks. So, um, of course it's the same thing in, in any type of, uh, business, uh, as, as well. No, and I think that, that I, I like that. And so I'm, I'll take that kind of the first point you hit on, which is you can't be a, or so afraid to lose any piece on the board that it holds you back from making the, the better decisions. And if I were to, you know, maybe put words in your mouth, so to speak, I think with the business, as you're looking at it, you know, there are always, there is no business that doesn't have any risk. The only business that doesn't have risk is the, when you're retired. In other words, you're always going to have to make decisions, trade-offs, there is no perfect amount of knowledge, you know, that if you have, you know, that you'll always have hundred percent knowledge and know exactly what happens with every scenario to the point that you won't have any trade-offs. And so now if you're so worried that you're going to make a mistake or you're going to lose money on adventure, or you, if you try a new system, it may fail or a new feature, then you get, you know, almost stagnant with the business and you get everybody passing you by. And so it kind of seems like maybe putting words in your mouth is that maybe one of the takeaways is to, you have to be willing to take risk or in other words, you're having to willing to fail or have pieces taken off the board in order to ultimately succeed with their business? Is that a, a fair fair statement? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. You know, you need to take risks. Um, and then there's a lot of other things as well, you know, like an organizational behavior, right? Every single employee uh, needs to have uh, a job. Uh, you know, same thing in chess. You know, sometimes um, I'll see a lot of beginners uh, in the opening uh, like move a bunch of pawn moves. Um, hmm. and I, you know, and I'll, I'll ask them like sort of why, and they'll be like, Oh, I got to like save my pieces back. You know, I, I, I need them to be like protected. Um, but yeah, like the truth is if you don't develop your pieces early on, you're not essentially using them. So yeah, every, every single, you know, employee, uh, you know, like needs a job. Mm, no, I think that 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 definitely makes sense. And I like how you're hitting on as well is that each piece does have a different designated assigned job. And maybe that's you known business, you each have your own role, right? So everybody has to do something, some pieces and some roles are more critical than others, you need to protect them and others are saying, hey, it's just going to be part of the, the game or the business you're playing. Now, one of the other ones that I'm, you know, a bit fascinated with chess, and I'm horrible at it, is be able to see multiple moves in advance, you know, and that's probably where I always gravitate towards chess is in the sense that <laughs> I applaud people that can see multiple moves in advance of if I do this and my, you know, the person on the other side competitors can do this and if they do this and I'll do this and so on and can think out those eventualities. My very limited ability to think I'm usually about one step in advance. I'm like, okay, well, if I move here, they'll probably move here. And then I have to figure out my next step from that. But how do you kind of gear your mindset more towards thinking strategically or multiple steps in advance and how do you is there a way to develop that or to think about that or am i completely wrong on chess and i really should only be thinking about the one next move or how do you know how does that work yeah i mean uh just like anything else uh you know calculating is uh definitely uh very uh important um and it's uh yeah obviously a a big part of of, of the game um there are by the way like some players that like calculate more than others. Um, I am, for instance, uh, relatively, uh, you know, more like intuitive player actually than uh, mm. others. Uh, but um, yeah, like I, I do think it's uh, important to, uh, you know, o o always look ahead, um, you know, like complete beginners will, you know, very often like capture a piece at every single chance 
uh, you know, not even realizing that like it's protected. Uh, hmm. Right. So, you know, I, 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 it can be like a little interesting, uh, you know, when you're working with beginners that, uh, yeah, like they see a potential capture and they just immediately go for it uh, without mm -hmm. even thinking why their opponent might like want you to uh, take the piece. Right. So uh, my friend, Max Delugi, uh, who's uh, a strong grandmaster, he uh, has been on, on my podcast, actually. Um, likes to talk about, uh, you know, the idea that chess is like a duel, right? If your opponent, uh, you know, offers you something, whether it be a piece or anything else, your initial uh, instinct should actually be that, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't do it, right? Because your opponent hmm. is, right, is your opponent, right? So if, he, if he's offering you something, uh, it doesn't say, like, don't take it, but yeah, you should be a little, uh, you know, worried as to why he actually wants to give it to you. No, I think that that's a, a, a good point. And I said, it's interesting that I think that you have to look and see, are they, are they sacrificing things for a reason? Are they appearing to give up ground just so that they can make it up later on? And, you know, one of the things that came to mind as you're talking about that is a lot of times you have, you know, what in a lot of industries are called loss leaders, right? In other words, it is a product where they're giving it away or they're losing money as they're acquiring customers, but they're doing just that as acquiring customers. And so you have some businesses that are so risk averse. So they're saying, well, we, we can't lose money on a given product. And you have to look at it more holistically of, hey, I'm going to give up this one. I'm going to give up that that uh, player or, or in that case, you know, the, or this, you know, loss leader product or service in the anticipation that I will get a longer term customer that will be make it or make up for it. Now right. I want to sh shift gears just a little bit if I can, because one of the other things I think in the even broader broadening it out from, you know, even just chess to more of what your business is, which is really a lot to do as, as I understand it with classes and training and, and whether it's corporate or one-on-one -on -one or for kids and in school, and there's a few different avenues, but I think a lot of times that's appealing to business or to individuals or to startups and small businesses is, Hey, I want to, whether it's an online course and they, Hey, if I can make an online course and I shoot the video once and then people will just pay me for it and I can sit back and relax, which I don't think is ever the case, but you always see those type of ads or you can do trainings and you can do other things. And so you have everything from coaching and you people want to get into coaching your motivational speakers or being mentors or having classes or trainings. And I think it's a whole industry in and of itself, but as, as people are kind of looking or exploring in that, you know, how do they go about even getting an understanding of what are some of the tips as you're trying to start that business? If you're to say kind of starting from day one, so to speak, how do you even go about getting that started? Um, I think the, the biggest thing is just moving forward. Um, you know, we, we did incorporate until, uh, you know, we basically had checks written out to premier chess that, uh, you know, I couldn't deposit. So, um, hmm. I think the, the biggest thing is just not, uh, you know, like hesitating and just doing, hmm. uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, we look, uh, we're, uh, started the business in, in July of 2017 and yeah, within two months we were in 14 schools. And, uh, you know, I had 10 instructors, uh, you know, working with us and, uh, you know, we just kind of like, you know, went full force. Now, when you, and when you went full force, cause that makes it sound really easy. Well, we started to get, we formed, we started to get it. And from there we signed on 14 schools. How did you figure out, you know, what your courses would, and, and I'm sure it's a bit of an evolution in, in figuring that out. But how did you figure out what is it going to be when you say, okay, I want to make an industry and we'll take your example of chess, but I think even trainings, getting into schools or doing courses or going into businesses and corporate and that, did you figure, hey, I'm going to just go teach people how to do chess or I'm going to give them overall strategies or it's going to be clubs or it's going to be, how did you kind of figure out what or how to even go uh, approach or utilize that skill set in a business or, pers or purpose? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, look, if there's one thing I, I've learned from my time actually in corporate America, you know, everything should be very customizable. Uh, you know, people will reach out, you know, ask, uh, you know, what do our programs, you know, sort of look like, right? And my response always is, you know, that's up to you. You know, our, our programs are, 
you know, 100% customizable. Uh, so, um, you know, there's not like a, a standard, uh, you know, sort of like, you know, exact curriculum or something like that, that we follow, you know, we really try to, uh, you know, do what, uh, you know, ever the client, uh, you know, what, what would actually want. So, um, yeah, like being, being custom is, uh, I would say like the, the, the biggest thing. So no, and I, I think that's an interesting point. And I, cause I think that if I were to push back on or, or give the counter argument a bit is if you're, if you're always trying to customize it to the point of your com, or completely changing this or the business for every single client, then it gets hard to have a consistent brand or messaging or even clearly communicate what you're going to be doing. And so question I'd be, and I think it's an interesting or, or to hear your thoughts or feedback is you're trying to customize it to different clients or customers. Are you going out and kind of pitching or, you know, or, or trying to sell them on an idea and then customizing it from there, or are they coming to you and saying, Hey, I need this type of a course or training. And then you say, yeah, we can build something around that or kind of what is the order of figuring out how to customize, you know, what you're offering to each client? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it, it varies for sure. Um, you know, we, we do certainly have a lot of inbound leads. Um, uh, and, but, uh, yeah, we, we do certainly, uh, you know, go to a lot of conferences, things like that as well. We were, you know, for instance, at the national uh, after school uh, conference uh, in Las Vegas back in uh, March. So, um, but yeah, I, I think in, in each case, you know, look, once we see that two sides have actual interest in a program, uh, that's when we'll, you know, set up a discovery call, figure out uh, if we're, you know, doing something virtually or in person. Uh, mm -hmm. after school or during the day um, many people by the way will come to us and just kind of assume that uh, you know all of our programs are like after school so um, we'll kind of like have that conversation um, and then uh, yeah really just figure out like what 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 what's what's it for them you know so um, yeah I tell you all the time you know we're in about 80 schools now and like literally no two contracts have been uh, the same so it's all uh you know, about no, I think that that's a, or definitely interesting. I, I think it's a, a, an interesting approach because you have some that are one want to make a course one size fits all. And you're saying, hey, at least for what we do, it needs to be customized because every every entity or every or partner that you're working with has different needs. And so with that, one of the things that we'd also talked on a bit before the podcast, which it, it kind of almost is a natural transition there is you know, one of the things that you, I think, have done pretty well, and it is mentioned is developing partnerships and that it sounds like it's everything from corporate to school to clubs to everything else. And you've been able to go out, make, you know, develop not just a one off kind of a, hey, we'll come in and do a one time training or a one time event, but rather partnering with them. So how did you how do you go about identifying or, or finding those partners? Is it more reputation, building a brand, and they're coming to you, and then, you know, they're asking you to be a partner, or is it more proactive, and you're going out and searching for them and identifying them, or is it kind of a scatter shot? you know, I'll just hit as many part people that are potential partners as I can and see which ones stick, or how do you go about developing partnerships? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's definitely both. Um, if you go, actually, to premierchess.com slash partners, um, you'll see, actually, two sections. Uh, you know, one is uh, clients, um, all the you know, people who have actually hired us uh, for services. Um, and then there's, uh, I think we call the business uh, partners. Um, mm. Yeah, where there's an education section, a legal section, uh, several other sections uh, as well. And, uh, you know, look, that actually is one of the ways that we've driven uh, a, a lot of business. You know, I have, uh, you know, a great uh, referral network. Um, I used to be in a BNI group, uh, no longer, but uh, I was there um, a lot on LinkedIn as well. You know, you and I, uh, obviously, as, as, as you know, you know, just met uh, on LinkedIn, uh, but already mm -hmm. have uh, been able to do a fair amount together. You know, I was on your first show, you were on my show, uh, and I'm saying on, on, on this one. So, um, yeah, really, it's uh, that's also a, a great way to, uh, you know, grow the network, of course. It definitely makes sense. So now sh or shifting gears just yet again, just because there's a lot of fun topics and I'd love, I love to touch on a few of them. One of the other things that we 
touched on just a bit, but I'd love to drill down a bit more is you said, you know, one of the things I, and I'm paraphrasing you or hopefully paraphrasing you and about accurate is that it really, I think that one of the important things is just to get started. In other words, a lot of the hindrance of people not being able to, whether it's chase after the dreams, build a business, or otherwise, or find success is that they just don't get started. So I guess it's a two part question, which I never try, I always try and avoid just so it doesn't get too complicated. But what do you think are the things that hinder people from getting started? Or why don't people get started? And how do you kind of overcome that hump and just get started or do something? Well, I think a lot of it is very simple. You know, it's just limiting beliefs. You know, people think, uh, look, I, I honestly, I, I at one point did have a limiting belief that, you know, pretty much most of the schools in New York that like wanted chess programs, uh, you know, had chess programs. Uh, but the truth is that's like definitely not the case. Um, you know, I, I was surprised in the beginning of the business when, you know, I had a school in Jersey City once tell me like, wow, like, thank you so much for, you know, reaching out. Uh, you know, no one ever has approached us uh, before about uh, setting up uh, a chess program. Hmm. So uh, it just got to a point where uh, I just realized that, uh, like, yeah, there, there's so much out there. that, And and yes, you know, there are 10 schools in, in New York Uh you know, that have very big chess programs, you know, Dalton, uh, Trinity, uh, uh, Columbia Grammar. Uh, none of these, by the way, have, have programs with us. Uh, you know, they're all other companies, but, um, but the, the, these schools are, are very well known to, you know, have chess programs. And the truth is, it's, you know, a little crazy, but uh, yeah, a lot of people over the years have been, you know, quote unquote, trying to steal it or like take over, uh, you know, the, the, these programs, uh, but, uh, you know, outside of, outside of those, um, yeah, there's, you know, so many schools that have, you know, never even considered uh, mm. yes before. Oh, that's interesting. And I think that one of the takeaways a little bit is, you know, if you had just simply taken the approach of, hey, well, somebody has got to do it. I'm, you know, I what makes me special? And, you know, then you would probably just never even bother to get started in the sense that you've already talked yourself out or you defeated yourself and you've already convinced yourself, but you're almost setting yourself up to fail. Well, hey, somebody's already got to do it. And, you know, I've, it's already got to been done. And what am I, what makes me special, so to speak, to the point that, you know, now you're not even, You've, you're not even competitive because you're not even thinking that you can succeed. Whereas, you know, in your case, you just said, well, maybe it has or hasn't been done. I'll go take a little bit of a look at it, but I'm going to get started because there's plenty of room and opportunity. And so with that, one thing to, to follow up on is, you know, maybe to round out the question is, is when you did get started, you know, when you decide, hey, I'm just going to get started, I'm going to try it out and go for it. What was the first thing you did to, to get started? Uh, I remember, you know, the first thing I, I did was, you know, very simple. I, I, I did some brainstorming, you know, figure out what relationships I you know, already had. Um, you know, one of my best friends, uh, Sam Davidson, his, his father, uh, you know, is the head. Well, actually, he's retiring uh, like this month, actually. Uh, but he's been the headmaster uh, for many, many years of the Grace Church School in, in the city. And, uh, you know, I just actually asked if, if, uh, that, like, why don't you have a chess program? Uh, he's like, I have no idea. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we came into his office, you know, we spoke. Uh, two later, we signed a contract and, you know, we were good to go. Um, and then, yeah, I, you know, posted on social media, you know, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, I just started, you know, building contact lists. So, uh, you know, I think I started uh, focusing. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I started just, I think, with, with uh, basically two lists, you know, the top 100 schools like in New York, uh, private schools, mm -hmm. um, and then like the top 100 schools all over the country, actually. Um, and, and, I, and I also just realized that the chess industry could actually be a lot bigger than it is. Um, I'm one of the few chess, or Premier Chess is one of the few chess companies out there that's willing to 
like take home clients all over the country, um, which, you know, a, a lot of people are, not but ultimately if you could, you know, trust people um, and hire friends, friends of friends, uh, you know, you're able to. So like one of our first couple of school programs was, you know, in, in Maine, for instance. So. Oh, that's awesome. That's uh, definitely kind of fun to hear how you guys got started. And I like the idea of, hey, I'm going to create a list. I'm going to say who are the top people I can approach. And I'm going to go out and see if I can, one, convince them, but even more so understand, you know, why they don't have chess programs or what's the holdup and then work to convince them of the of the benefits of that. And I think that's a, definitely a, a fun, a great way to start and a, a good idea. And I think it's just to that point is getting started. I'm going to put a list. I'm going to go out to talk with people. Simple as that. And yet it's a, the beginnings of the business and then gets it started. So, well, we could talk for, I'm sure a much longer time about all the, or a whole bunch of different things. And we only hit to eat only a portion of the list. So I'm sure we'll have to have you on to uh, this podcast again, or to one of the, the sister podcasts uh, in the series. Um, but as we start to wrap up, I always have one question I'd like to end, a, ask the end of each episode before we dive to that. Um, just as a teaser reminder to the audience is we also have the bonus question. We're going to talk here a little bit about one of Evan's uh, great uh, crazy entrepreneurial ideas, which is always a fun, uh, fun bonus section. And I'm um, looking forward to that one. So if you want to hear that answer or hear that idea and hear that answer, definitely stay tuned after we wrap up this normal episode and, 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 and catch that. But for those people that uh, wanting to hear the final answer to the normal final question, we'll dive to that now, which is within your in or within your industry, what is the biggest myth and why is it wrong? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, look, I honestly, there, there's a lot, uh, you know, actually, I, I, I kind of talk about this all the time, you know, common things that like my chess players will say, but um, I think the biggest one that, you know, I, I like to actually talk about uh, is just that it's, it's not for kids. <laughs> you know, uh, very often you know, I'll go to the networking events and, uh, you know, tell people about, you know, the business and they'll say, oh, like, that's really, really cool. You know, I'll let you know if I hear of any parents looking for, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a chess teacher for, for their kid. Um, and I actually will play a little dumb and I'll, I'll, I'll actually tell them, like, or I'll ask them, you know, I mean, what, what made you think it's just about kids? They're like, hmm, I'm not really sure. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, we do do classes at Google, Citigroup, uh, other major corporations. Um, mm. And we teach, you know, business and life values through the game. So um, also, right, one, you know, limiting belief that a lot of people have is, wow, I, I, I wish I learned chess, uh, you know, as, as a kid. Um, well, uh, you know, it, yes, it's definitely better uh, like anything to get started early, uh, you know, most lawyers, right. Just actually went to law school, you know, one or two years out of college. Uh, but there are certainly, you know, lawyers who started a legal career, you know, much later in life. So, uh, it's the same thing with chess. You know, I once had the privilege of teaching a Holocaust survivor chess for the first time. So, um, you know, that, that I would say that's another like misnomer. No, I, I like that. And I think that one is you're having to address, you know, preconceived notions and just because people think it's kids because everybody, grow, you know, people oftentimes think, oh, you grow up and you play chess, but you're not going to make your career out of it or what's it applicable. And I think that, uh, you know, addressing that concern is definitely a myth. And then I also like the, a bit, or the other ones you hit on as well. And so definitely some fun takeaways on what the myths are and, and why they're wrong. So with that, as we wrap up the episode and before we hit on the bonus question, if people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an investor, they want to be an employee, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, or find out more? Thank you. So, yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, wants to learn more, whatever, um, certainly feel free to reach out. Of course, you can check out our website, premierchess.com. Uh, email evan at premierchess.com uh, or if you want to book an appointment directly on my calendar you can do that at www.calendly.com awesome well i definitely encourage people uh, to reach out <laughs> <laughs> go ahead you said there's slash what uh, www.calendly.com slash premierchess 
All right. Probably if they just go to Calvary.com, they're going to get a whole different thing. So good thing we got the slash in there. So, well, awesome. Well, with that, uh, as we wrap up, I definitely encourage people to reach out, contact you, find out more, and uh, maybe uh, or whether it's uh, get an event going, uh, get their learn chess, or, or just uh, reach out and get some good ideas of how to start um, some of the businesses or business perspectives as we've, as we've hit on. Now, for all of you that are listeners, um, if you have uh, one or one thing that you can help us out with is if you can leave a, a review, uh, click share and or uh, subscribe always helps so that we can make sure that everyone finds out about all these great areas of expertise so that can help their business to be successful and to grow. And on that note, if you ever need help with your patents or trademarks or anything else with your startup, your small business, reach out to us at Miller IP Law by just going to strategymeeting.com and grabbing some time with us to chat. With that, now as we've wrapped up the normal section of the episode, of the episode, it's always fun uh, to, uh, or to, to have the bonus question, uh, which is I always kind of call the idea pile or the someday idea pile in the sense that, you know, there's always for, at least for me, there's always those ideas that I always think are great ideas that I always want to pursue. And yet I never quite have the time or always going to say someday I'm going to pursue those. And they're really, you know, they may be great ideas or fun ideas. And yet I never quite get to them. And yet I always want to. And so it's always fun to hear kind of what other I, crazy ideas or what are in other people's someday piles. And so with that, you'd mentioned that you have a, uh, dance uh dance dating app or something of that nature so tell us a little bit about the the one crazy entrepreneurial idea that you have um yeah so um it's not actually something i, I really have uh do much any, anymore but uh, actually this was the first sort of entrepreneurial uh thing that I, I considered um actually my former oracle colleague uh tan hong uh actually uh, had this idea you know we were uh, teammates at, at, at oracle and uh just after work one day we were hanging out and uh he brought up this idea of doing uh a new social uh media uh app uh slash uh, a dating app um and uh basically the idea was you would uh you know, either like dance with someone or, uh, you know, go out, uh, you know, for a drink with someone. Uh, so, yeah, it was just an interesting uh, app that, uh, you know, uh, was kind of a mix of like a dating app and just kind of a generic uh, social media uh, app. Um, and we did actually uh, do some design work on it, uh, having like wireframes and all that. Um, so I never actually got off the ground. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was, a, you know, at, at least educational for me just to, uh, you know, teach me like what it is to, you know, start a business, you know, how to design a product, uh, you know, how to work with a, a business partner, uh, you know, and, and, and a lot more. Awesome. Well, definitely sounds like a, a fun idea to pursue. And I could see, so if, if maybe to one follow-up question, because you kind of hit on two different applications. One is if maybe you're just looking for someone to go out and dance and have fun or otherwise get out and, and meet people, network rather, regardless of dating. So do you almost see it as kind of two different or two different paths it could take where one is it's a, hey, this is a dating app because if you're really passionate about dancing and I am, we'll, we'll start out with something in common. And it also gives you a great first date that you can go out and you already have that kind of pre-planned so it seems like you could do it in the dating app or it could just be finding other people that are passionate about dancing that are just fun so which path do you see it going or is it kind of one where it could be used for both um honestly i haven't thought about this for <laughs> a long time uh you know it was just you know i, I saw your questions and just uh it's like oh I, I was actually reminded of it um so yeah, it could definitely go, uh, you know, in any direction, but uh, that was actually the point, you know, that it could mm -hmm. uh, kind of be for everyone, you know, even people like, you know, in a relationship, people not in a relationship, uh, you know, kind of, kind of everyone. All right. Well, I think I think you, you should do it now. I'll caveat it with I don't or I'm not a dancer at all. And I've, I've got the opposite of a dancer. Where I have zero rhythm and zero moves. But I have another uh, office mate that's uh, here and on the marketing team that he actually went into ballroom dancing. I can't remember if he got a degree in it or he just or he was he was pretty or got pretty good at it. And so I'll have to mention it to him. And maybe when maybe that when you get to the someday pile and you build it, he'll be your first client. So or the first person to download it and use the app. So with that, thank you again for coming on the podcast. It's been a fun. It's been a pleasure. And uh, definitely wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. 
my, I appreciate it. And yeah, thank you so much for your time.